You ever wonder what the world will be like if one day, just one day, God decides to let our emotional scars be visible? Can you imagine the screaming, the monsters amongst us, and how we cringe in fear over our own creations? Or what if God decides to be sadistically creative by tearing down the boundaries that keeps the inner demons from running wild? Here we live in a world where horror resides with ghosts that lurk within the dark, the monsters underneath our bed, them unknown terrors that haunt our galaxies, and how far we humans are willing to go to prove the existence of these supernaturals. But why? You ever wonder why? That may be the reasons why humans pursue these fantasies and fables is so they can find something that can relieve them from the anguished pains of reality, from screaming throughout the night. A remedy from the real horrors. Personally, I find it amusing when humans deem society boring, dull, and how they've grown exhausted with most of the human race being hidden behind this bullshit image of positivity. If they only knew, what horrors are truly hidden behind that plastic smile and facade. Now imagine, if there came a day when God grows tired of the cowardice and ignorance, exhausted over the charade, and all of a sudden we humans are blessed with the courage to be our true selves. Imagine the day when we see humanity for what it truly is, when our demons are freed to run wild. Nobody knows how it began, and nobody knows where to begin. Our story is a horror that has countless beginnings and many endings. Overall, it is a story that will never end until the final human draws his or her last breath. But if you want a place to start, for today's story, I think we'll start on a Sunday evening at a place called Jim Jr's Diner, just a small joint full of regulars going about their own business and monotonous routine. Yes, if you want to start, then let's start with a moment when he entered the diner. A random stranger whose shirt was covered with blood. How the man reeked like piss. To this day, Stan will never forget how nobody noticed the guy when he came into the diner. Until he walked up to the cashier and tossed a blood-covered slab of meat and bone onto the counter. Which looked like a severed spinal cord from an animal. It wouldn't be until much later before Stan found out it wasn't from an animal. At first everyone thought it was a prank. You know, with today's world with them reality shows and YouTubers doing stupid shit. But no, something about this was different. Something about this guy did not feel right with Stan. The man said nothing, but clearly his body language was saying a lot. Also had these rashes on his face as if they were forming into a pattern of a red cross. The man looked both ill and driven, possibly a junkie. That's what Stan assumed when looking around and seeing nobody filming with their phones nor any cameras outside. Obviously Jim didn't take too kindly to the man's presence, nor the prank, which he thought it was a prank. Seeing his share of junkies and weirdos wandering into the diner, Jim wasn't hesitant in tossing out another freak playing Halloween. It happened so fast, nobody didn't see it coming when the man grabbed Jim's head and bit off his nose before Cindy smashed the man's face with a coffee pitcher. You would have thought that the scolding coffee burning the man's face, decorated with glass shards, would have him screaming in pain, but the guy just kept laughing as blood poured from his face. It was like the sick fuck was enjoying the pain. Cindy was tending to Jim, trying to control the bleeding from his torn nose. But before anyone started conceiving the idea of calling the authorities after adjusting to the reality of the situation, Stan remembered the brief moment of relief when hearing the sirens outside, before those feelings turned into a concern when hearing the sounds of crashing. Outside was a patrol car that had just crashed into a building. Immediately tending to the scene, Stan could see the driver's body on the smashed hood of the car. The man's neck and body was broken, and yet, he was still alive, barely. At first Sam thought the man was choking in pain, but he was actually laughing, or at least trying to. Much like the junkie, he too had the same red rash pattern and the same sadistic drive on his face. And as the patrol car erupted in flames, to Stan's horror, he could see that two men were still alive in the car. One of them, a cop, 
screaming in pain as with the other preventing him from escaping. That was the last thing Stan saw before both men would be engulfed in flames. Stan wanted to save the man, but how? And staring at the cop's burnt hand reaching out from the flames, Stan just watched the final signs of life trying to free itself from the pain, a last hopeless effort to be saved. What the hell is going on? Five minutes since that guy entered the diner, and now a patrol car engulfed in flames, followed by a sudden sharp piercing noise that knocked Stan to the ground, deafening his hearing to the chaos around him. Right above was an airliner flying too close to the ground, nearly crashing into the town hall. It was like the airliner had no control. Everything around Stan had lost control and running wild. Way too much was happening, way too fast to process. Stan just sat there, deaf and dumb to the birthing of this new world. Could not understand what was happening, still deaf to the growing sounds of sirens, explosions, and screaming that was now filling the midnight skies. The city was now bright with an orange glow. The city was on fire. Burn, baby, burn. Stan didn't see it when Jim came out of the diner and ran up to a guy next to him, stabbed him with a kitchen knife. When he saw Jim widening the wound with the knife and watching Jim fit his stubby erection into the stab wound, Stan was trying to get a grasp of what was going on, one shock after another. It was like his body was denying every urge to have his arms and legs work again. Stan trying to get his shit together so he could pull Jim off the guy. Of all the horrors that was unfolding, Stan was at least thankful he was facing the wrong direction when the sky, the world around him was suddenly erupted by a blinding light. Stan, still trying to understand, was this a terrorist attack? Was it China? Russia? It was like his mind was now throwing up whatever words that matched the picture. And when Stan finally stood up, gazed upon the explosion at the other end of the city, now numb to Jim raping the man's corpse right next to him, his frantic laughs to the man's suffering cries. Stan just stood there, watching the chaos unfold around him. The birthing of a new world. The beginning of the end. Till this day, nobody knows how it started. Nobody knows if it was a terrorist attack, an experiment gone wrong, who was the first to get bit, or where the disease came from, if it is a disease. Six months down the road, and still no answers. No way of anyone doing any real research for a cure. Not when humanity is too busy running, hiding, surviving. It's doubtful if humanity would even stand a chance of surviving the cross. That's what we call them, the crossed. There is one theory, however, which explains why nobody is praying these days. That this is God's judgment upon humanity, which happens to be quite a popular theory. Maybe it is true. Maybe one day, God just got fed up with the bullshit. Yeah, he just got sick and tired of it. A meteor would have been a merciful end. But instead, the good Lord decides to take away the very thing that keeps our demons at bay. Ten minutes. That's how long it took before the world went to shit for Stan. Ten minutes. Before God and everything else stopped making sense. But for some people, maybe it does make sense. Maybe God is a sadistic cocksucker. For some people, maybe this is a war against God. And you know what? After everything that followed that night for Stan, maybe, just maybe, they're right about that. Maybe this is a war against God. You'll be hearing things about blood sacrifice, death, occultic symbols, the upside down cross, possession, distorted faith, darkness. All these things are involved in satanic worship. Good morning, class. Just can't get enough education from our sick, twisted, shameful history, can you? Now, be good and get on your hands and knees for Daddy. Your Lord needs a stage to teach today's history lesson. A saying that I always fancy from Winston Churchill. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And I would say we've had our share of people who have failed that course, haven't they? I don't know, but if I were a betting man, 
Looks like Hitler might be having some competition. So today's lesson, no executions, no ideas for the torture methods running through your sadistic minds. Today we're going to cover one of the greatest entertainers of all time. Susan Wojcicki proudly presents the perfect celebrity to be slapped onto the trending page. Gaius Caesar Caligula. Oh yes. If you think YouTube boxing is something, you haven't seen anything yet, my friends. Imagine the crowd going wild when seeing them Paul brothers fist fighting a pack of lions, or a drama alert that never fails making the news with a public execution. Now Caligula was not always bad. Born in 12 AD, son of Germanicus, who was a great warrior of that time, and nephew of the reigning emperor Tiberius. Another loony who found himself in power. As I said, my friends, how we humans are doomed to repeat the same mistakes when putting a loony in power. It was after Germanicus mysteriously died from poison. Caligula was found under the care of the emperor. With his uncle and the other soldiers seeing him in battle dress as a child, that was how Gaius was given the name Caligula, which meant little boots. Oh, how Tiberius taught Caligula everything he needed to know about the world and its ways. The orgies, the executions, the torture methods. Anything to keep the people happy and ignorant from the reality of living in filth and disease. And how to keep those close to you in constant and obedient fear. It wasn't until 37 AD when Tiberius had fallen to a strange illness. And while well, Caligula's patience paid off by killing the old man himself. Supposedly. And that was when the Roman Senate came up with a brilliant idea of giving the throne to Caligula. Now, at first Caligula was loved by the Romans when he cut taxes, restored aristocracy, and declared general amnesty. For fun, he would toss gold coins to the cheering crowds as they would scramble before his feet. But it was not until six months into his reign before a strange illness began to take over Caligula, and a spiteful nature would emerge beginning with an incident where he spent weeks in bed, writhing and screaming in pain. And well, when people thought that death was upon him, and possible talks of treachery, it may be the idea of murder on people's minds, to have Caligula go out the same way Tiberius did. Caligula emerged as a new man. Well, more than a man, I guess. Except historians and rumors claim that it was a fever that did something to his mind. Or was it the common backstabbing ways you see in today's world? Oh, Caligula emerged as a new man, all right. For he was now a monarch, something of a pharaoh to his people, but it didn't stop there, my friends. Shortly, Caligula began idolizing himself something of a Greek myth in the flesh. And eventually, much like every other social media star in today's world, Caligula's mind began reaching godhood. How Caligula demanded his subjects to worship him, that no man shall ever look down upon him, literally. No man is to find himself looking down on Caligula. Sucks to be you if you decide to say hi while seeing him waltzing around on the lower level. Also how sacrilege does not apply to a god such as himself when Caligula replaced the head of Jupiter's statue with his own. And like all pharaohs, he even changed the rules by marrying his sister Drusella. Now to the Roman people, they just dismissed Caligula as an eccentric leader. But they never knew the stories of his badness, and how that bizarre behavior would paint Caligula as one of the most dangerous and psychotic men in history. From stories how he pointed his favorite horse as Roman consul, to building bridges as ships across the Naples to mock a battle. Instead of being an emperor, Caligula was a man of entertainment, keeping his subjects happy by spending his uncle's fortune on the spruce goose, a galley of ten oars, and bread, orgies, and circuses for the Roman people. But I guess when this god began finding his uncle's fortune down to a few coins, that's when Caligula began stripping away the very thing he built by destroying aristocracy and increasing taxes on just about everything in Rome. A god should never be without an endless supply of gold. It wasn't until the final days of Caligula playing emperor when Rome would find itself drowning in a sea of tears, screams, misery, madness, and bloodshed. Our eccentric leader had now indulged himself within the exquisite taste of sadistic cruelty, where sons were tortured as their fathers were forced to watch, wives would be humiliated and raped as their husbands were forced to watch. Now with the Roman population turning against him, Caligula's madness had only escalated to where he took joy in humiliating and mocking the Roman army by having them wage war against Neptune by attacking a channel and bring back seashells as proof of their victory. 
Now with the appearance of a middle-aged bald man at the age of 29, debauchery had finally taken its toll on the Mad Emperor. Caligula's madness, or illness, would normally come with epileptic fits or slobbering convulsions. An emperor who was completely surrounded by people who wished him dead, and yet he still had the courage or the arrogance to make his rounds on the streets with no guards nor weapons. The moments of relishing the fear he installed in Rome, his greatest achievement was seeing the Roman people tremble before him. It was as if Caligula was so confident of the fear he installed in Rome, daring people to eliminate a god during one of his walks in the city. And well, I guess on one day, a group led by a centurion guard took up that dare by stabbing Caligula 30 times when passing by an imperial theater. <laughs> Even at the very end, Caligula still urged on his attackers, bragging how he was still alive, and um, that's how Caligula died. Well class, that's how gods die. Gaius Caesar, aka Caligula. Death by 30 community strikes by YouTube. The Roman way. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mojave Desert, precise location, Jeremiah's Paradise. Unknown to many, known to only a few. Just off the I-15, near the off-beaten path, that's a three-hour drive from Marvin's low-gas pit stop. Today, my friends, we get to participate on a long journey through hell alongside one of America's most notorious and ruthless hitmen. Charles Dell Flannery, a man who takes great pride with his reputation. Discreet, unforgiving, and has a special taste for murder and torture. Let's just say that there is not a single person within the criminal underground that operates within Nevada, Arizona, and California who had not heard about Charles Flannery and his ability to strike fear into the hearts of the most hardened and violent of criminals. Charles is the kind of man that only understands two things, money and reputation. Meaning that if you can pay top dollar, having a man like Charles on your side can definitely bring down the competition. But unfortunately, it seems like Charles is having a bit of misfortune. A special job that kind of went wrong when his 1990 Ford LTD that Charles used ended up breaking down. Of all places, right in the heart of the Mojave Desert, which explains why there's a burning car a few yards away from Charles, and why our ruthless hitman is now making a long journey back to Marvin's gas station, a three-hour drive away. Lord knows how long it will take on foot. But all Charles needs to do is just head east, find the dirt path he took to get here, and at around 3 p.m., Charles can finally be free from this burning hell. Even though Charles finally reached the dirt path, he was a bit skeptic seeing how he could not shake away the feeling that the path was much closer than he remembered. But either way, it was no big deal. The heat was something that Charles did not expect. It was like 110 degrees, the sun bathing him with its unforgiving light. His white button-up shirt completely drenched with sweat, his body reeking with a rancid odor, every muscle in his legs giving him that intense pain, numbing his mind to where Charles's body and mind desperately wanted to consume every drop of water within the canteen he had, to relax and take a rest. But of course, Charles could not afford wasting any more time out here, nor would it be wise to get greedy with the water. And then there was the ants. He stumbled across 20 minutes ago when taking a small breather near a piece of discarded rubble. Ants, half the size of a dime, red with yellow abdomens, Vicious little bastards, they got three good stings out of Charles, which hurt like hell. <laughs> Imagine a mafia boogeyman dancing and screaming after getting a few stinging pokes. Either way, 
It shouldn't be more than a couple of hours before finally reaching the gas station. So the question is, why is Charles all the way out in the middle of nowhere America? What the hell is this man doing in the Mojave Desert, in a place that the Las Vegas criminal underground would call Jeremiah's Paradise? Well, let's just say that there are some people in Las Vegas who you don't want to cross. Especially if you're an informant who's working with Mr. G, the kind of guy who happens to be one of the most notorious drug lords in Las Vegas, and who has the kind of connections that reach deep into law enforcement and politics. Which is how Mr. G found out about Wilfred Willie Boyd Johnson, someone who climbed the ranks and got himself working very close to Mr. G, and who had a history of putting a lot of men behind bars. Turns out Willie was the one who was responsible for putting an end to Rick Barnes in New Mexico. So when Mr. G found out about Willie Boy, that's when our hitman Charles comes into the story. The job was simple. Make him suffer. Make the rat cry. Make him bleed. Break him. And make sure that he disappears. So at 1 a.m. Charles decided to pay Willie Boy a visit. Give him a good beating, a few hard kicks in the head, making sure that no bones were broken before tying and tossing the beaten man into the trunk of his Ford LTD. Obviously, a man can't dig a grave when his bones are broken. You see, when Charles started off as a hitman, there was a guy he used to work with named Roscoe, the one who showed him Jeremiah's Paradise during a job. Not sure why it's called Jeremiah's Paradise, but it was definitely a place that was perfectly hidden away from the eyes of the law and human civilization. You could practically do anything you want here. Disposing bodies, drug dealing, etc, (laughs) etc. There were even stories of guys who came out here one time to test some illegal shit for male enhancement pills. Well, that's where Charles took Willie. Forced the man to dig his own grave, smoking half of his pack of lucky strikes while watching Willie Boy plead for his life while digging. The one part of the job that Charles found the most enjoyable. Each person he brings definitely knows how to give a pity show. And after putting a round into Willie's head when the grave was deep enough, just to end his pathetic whining, and two more into the heart, making sure Willie Boy does not end up as a miracle story living his life as a cripple, like that job in Anaheim. That's when Charles buried Willie, pissed on the grave as his unique way of saying farewell, yours truly, Mr. G, and was about to head back to Las Vegas to share the lovely news, only to find out that Charles decided to use a shitty car for a job, the engine dying out on him, of all places, in Jeremiah's paradise. Thankfully, Charles was smart enough to bring a canteen. His piece, a Smith & Wesson 45, a switchblade, and what's left of his lucky strikes. Lord knows what Charles would be doing if he didn't have his lucky strikes. But regardless, even for the most experienced hikers who's crazy enough to walk this nightmare, this is no place for a man. Way too many horror stories that are not known to the world. Not only is Charles facing extreme exhaustion, fatigue, his feet and legs are going numb because of the amount of walking he did, but nothing was more tormenting than those damn ants that were everywhere. That every time Charles stopped for a small rest, they start crawling on him, stinging him, except this time they got him really good on the right leg. Took a small breather a while ago. And that's where Charles noticed this strange lizard coming towards him. Ugliest damn thing he saw. Its stomach and neck bloated. Stumbling as if it were drunk or something. But when Charles slightly kicked the lizard to the side, when it got a little too close, that's when the reptile literally collapsed. And his right foot was swarmed by these damn ants, stinging his right lower leg before managing to shake them off. They really fucked up his lower leg swollen and extremely sensitive, making this journey a truly tormenting experience for our ruthless hitman. Aside from the bizarre ant attack, there was something else that was making Charles feel uncomfortable. 
in the far distance where Charles was at, our hitman couldn't help but notice two silhouettes. Spotted them about 30 minutes ago. Could be anything. Or nothing at all. Even though it was too far to tell what they were, Charles just couldn't help but get the feeling as if he was being followed. More like as if he was being hunted. Hours of venturing through the unforgiven terrain, being weighed down by the rising heat and a swollen leg bringing our hitman to a pitiful state as he pushed himself through this hellish journey, whimpering in pain and desperately wanting to be free from the unbearable heat. You would have thought that Charles finding shelter in the middle of nowhere, protection from the desert's cruelty, would be a blessing. Except, it wasn't. It was now a struggle of Charles trying to maintain his hopes of making out of this desert alive. You see, when Charles stumbled across the abandoned shack a few feet away from the dirt trail, that was when our hitman had felt the horrible reality of the situation he was in. The shack was not supposed to be here. Every time he visited Jeremiah's paradise for a job, there was never a shack on the dirt trail, which meant Charles must have taken the wrong path. Even though he could have sworn that there was only one off-beaten path, then again, that was something Charles was unsure about. Resting his body on a torn lawn chair, waiting till the heat dies down a bit, drinking enough water to keep his body hydrated with his near-emptied flask, relaxing his legs, trying to soothe his right lower leg, which had swollen bigger, turning into the color of dark red and purple gently rubbing the edges around his lower knee, attempting to ease the injured leg that would gradually send waves of pain through his body. Them fucking ants. If Charles didn't know better, he could have sworn the lizard was already dead. Probably not wise to be smoking a cigarette at a time like this, but seeing how Charles had gotten himself stuck in a shitty situation, the fact that he was now lost in the Mojave Desert. Lucky strikes. They help him relax. Think more clearer. Well, even though he'd taken the wrong dirt path, it was definitely a long stretch south, which meant that if Charles keeps traveling down this path, then most likely he should run into Marvin's gas station or the I-15. More importantly, Spending more time in this abandoned shack is a risk. Not a smart idea, because having a good look around the building, Charles could easily tell that this shack had seen its fair share of visitors and stories that was never meant for the world. The bed frame with a pair of stainless steel handcuffs, the syringe needles, liquor bottles, cigarette butts, condoms, and even a few shell casings scattered all around the filthy place. It's most likely that this wasn't just some man-made structure abandoned by humanity, given away to the elements of Mother Nature. Oh no, this place is a canvas for a horror story, something that Charles knew all too well. You see, as an author of his own set of stories, the kind of stories that never leave a place like the Mojave Desert, he is not the only one who comes to the desert and play the role as an author of a horror story. There are others who come here for reasons that are a little too much for a man like Charles. Sick-minded freaks that like to embrace their deepest and most twisted fantasies. Supposedly, there was a rumor in Las Vegas. A guy who runs a porn industry makes a small fortune on the side by creating snuff films selling them top dollar to every sick freak who gets off on things like that. There are even guys who come here to inflict their sick fantasy upon others. A kidnapped prostitute or some poor soul that was nabbed from the I-15, and go about the following day flipping burgers as a pastor of a Christian church or something like that. You'd be surprised how many people come here to enjoy the skeletons within their closet, which is why this is no place for a man. But with the heat rising outside and the right leg throbbing with pain, it wasn't like Charles had much of a choice. Just as long as he stayed awake while taking a small rest, stayed vigilant, 
then everything should be fine, even if he gets home much later than expected. And it wasn't no more than 20 minutes before Charles made the horrible mistake of succumbing to the small comforts of his situation and dozed off. One would say that the desert sunset would be a beautiful sight to enjoy. A moment of the day where one could enjoy themselves while not having a care in the world. Except for Charles. The sunset was a much different experience when his slumbering peace would be interrupted by the sound of something banging against the outside walls of the shack. Bringing this man in a state of alert. Gun in hand trying to assess the situation with his killer instincts. No headlights outside, no engine noises, nor distinct chatter, which was a good sign. But Charles could still hear the faint movement against the wall. Something was definitely out there, most likely a wild animal scrounging for food. And even though the swelling pain with his lower leg had eased down, it had still given Charles a slight limp when carefully leaving the shack. Whatever was outside was around the left side of the building. And even though the sun was sinking into the desert grounds, slowly bringing darkness upon the desert, Charles immediately knew that he wasn't alone in finding a woman just a few feet away from the shack and a man who looked like he was walking straight into the wall. The woman, whose face couldn't be seen because of her long, black, stringy hair, wearing nothing but a pair of dirty underwear and a torn shirt, her filthy body covered with markings and bruising and completely strung out. It was like she was oblivious to her surroundings. And then there was the guy who was literally trying to walk through the shack wall, also wearing nothing but a torn wife beater and a pair of dirty undershorts. God, how much these two reeked, filling the air with the smell of shit mixed with roadkill, almost causing our hitmen into a series of convulsions. <laughs> to think. Charles was worried about running into a drug dealer or something, only to find a pair of strung out junkies who kind of got a little too high on their own supply before wandering out into the desert. Kind of sucks that he's got to waste his bullets on these two, but then again, maybe he's doing them a favor, seeing how they look like they're pretty fucked up on some serious shit. After putting a few rounds into both the woman and the guy, kind of strange how they fell to the ground without making a sound. Like their entire bodies had immediately lost complete stability and collapsed. Not like the other kills that would normally fall either forward or backwards, expressing the final moments of life or even a muscle twitch. It was like there was something a bit off with these two, something that felt wrong. And when returning to the shack preparing to take the advantage of the cool temperature by continuing south. That was when Charles would be struck by an unexpected horror when being reunited with Wilfred Willie Boyd Johnson. There he was, stumbling near the entrance of the shack, his clothes and body covered with filth and dirt, a bullet hole in his head, and two bloody spots on the chest. The son of a bitch was still alive. Seeing Willie with no expression, milky green eyes staring lifelessly into the skies, Oblivious to his surroundings, had Charles struggling with the reality of the situation. If only Charles knew what horrors he was dealing with, he would have realized that shooting these zombies was a huge mistake. When watching Willie's decomposing body deflate as an endless swarm of ants began pouring out of his mouth, ears, nostrils, ants, escaping every orifice of Willie's body swarming the grounds below, trying to seek out Charles. Even the other two bodies had ants pouring from them, resulting with the shack and the surrounding area being swarmed with ants, searching for their next meal. And it was no longer than a minute before these ants found their prey, and the desert night would be greeted by a petrified hitman emptying his pistol before screaming into the night. Sunrise. Another sunrise. Another new beginning. But for Charles, it was the final touches to a traumatizing story. 
Now, a strong believer that he's going to have one hell of a survivor story when the end of his hellish journey is just a mile away. After managing to escape the ant swarm, Charles had no choice but to force himself through the long and torturous journey into the midnight desert. And trust me, the pain that Charles went through and is going through right now is nothing compared to the torment and suffering he inflicted upon so many. His entire body is literally swollen, sensitive to every step, every movement, sending waves of intense pain shooting through his body. Charles' skin felt so exposed to the elements of the desert, it felt like he was flayed. His entire skin was burnt. When the ants swarmed him, trying to bring down their oversized prey with their stings, it wasn't until five minutes after escaping the ants in the shack, his body began to experience a violent reaction, swelling to the very point where Charles looked inhuman. A freak of nature that looked dark and red, decorated with patches of bruising and small boils. Half of his face is swollen to the point where you couldn't see his left eye. May have lost half of his sight seeing how a strange white liquid was seeping from the slit of his swollen eye also losing his sense of smell. He would have noticed the strong and foul odor his body was emitting. And when the journey of Charles would be greeted by the desert sunrise and come upon a building structure in the far distance, just down the steep cliff a mile off, it took him a while before he could make out a sign that read LOW GAS in capital red letters, settled right next to a long stretch of road. He did it. That son of a bitch Charles had finally reached Marvin's gas station. Unfortunately, the pain and fatigue had gotten the better of the hitman. Not sure if it was his ruined body or broken mind giving out, but it was too much. Charles was now a grounded man, spending what was left of his sanity on a prayer. The cold-blooded murderer praying for God for the first time in his miserable life promising that his survival would end his criminal ways. Turning to Jesus, healing people instead of taking their lives to feed such an evil reputation. Dear God, uh, please I beg of you, forgive me. Forgive me for everything that I have done. Please give me the strength to overcome this nightmare. Please forgive my evil ways. Please have mercy on me. And when that prayer would slightly be muttered several times from the mouth of Charles as the sun began to bathe the Mojave Desert with its warming light, that was when a cooling shadow would greet the hitman's crippled body. A savior that Charles couldn't see because of how he stood in front of the rising sun. Whoever he was, he was big, towering over Charles with his massive size. And that was when our hitman began to shed a tear of joy from his right eye and mutter the words, thank you, God, thank you. And after expressing those words of joy and the savior began to move forward, that moment of immense happiness within Charles would suddenly turn into sheer terror when noticing how the large man was shuffling as if he barely had any control of his movement. When the man got close enough to where Charles could make out the features of his savior. It was a heavily oversized man, nude, his skin riddled with patches of dirt, bruising and decay. And when this savior got in close enough to where he was literally standing over Charles, the hitman could clearly see that several areas of the bloated body and massive gut would shift and move on its own, as if something inside just waiting to come out and greet Charles. And when getting a good look at the Savior's face, his milky green eyes staring off lifelessly, the edges of his mouth crusted with a strange greenish-white liquid, his neck swelling and bulging abnormally, as if something massive was trying to make its way from the man's insides up through the neck and forcing its way out of his mouth. It was when Charles saw an ant crawling from the corner of the man's mouth that was when Charles muttered his final words. There is no God. 
and the Lord Savior began to comfort the crippled hitman with his decaying body, bathing Charles with an endless swarm of ants spewing from the Savior's mouth, giving the Mojave Desert the screams of sheer pain and absolute horror before the ants found their way into his mouth, entering Charles's nose, ears, forcing their way inside him, feasting upon the insides of their crippled prey. Another sunrise, another day in hell for Marvin. It's supposed to be 110 degrees today. And after having his glorious moment in the shitter behind the gas station, results of aged coffee, Marvin didn't expect that the air outside would smell worse than the sorry excuse of a bathroom he had, especially after he was done with it. it smelled like something died and rotted in a pile of sun big shit. <laughs> Uh, you gotta love the fucking desert. And as Marvin lit up his cigar before heading back into the gas station, ready for another day of business in the desert, a mile away was the fleshy, rotten remains of an overweight body and a ruthless killer, his insides being liquefied into a greenish-white substance, being consumed by a horror story that can only exist within Jeremiah's paradise. A world where one can be the author of a horror story, or a victim. But either way, a story that will never leave the godforsaken place.